Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi. It's the 12th of October and I brought you here for a birthday celebration. Now, if I told you that a boy could be born the illegitimate son of a servant girl and a peasant farm worker in Victorian Britain, brought up in this single parent button Ben in lossy mouth and finishes full time education at the age of 12, but go on to become Prime Minister of Great Britain, would you know his name? If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then you can hit the subscribe button at the bottom right hand side of the screen at any time during this video. For more information, books, how to buy me a coffee or become a member, that's all in the description below. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Now there's no way that I can cover the life of Ramsay MacDonald in a 10 minute video. All I can do is to give you just a taste. Now his mum wasn't only or always a servant, she was also a seamstress. A dirty seamstress. It's actually also been suggested that the reason for his illegitimacy was that MacDonald's grandmother thought that her daughter, Anne Ramsay, was above marrying a peasant farm worker, even if she'd, you know. MacDonald was lucky to have been born in Scotland, where an impoverished child could get a basic education if his mother really wanted it. And at the age of 12, he was able to continue with his education by being a pupil teacher, helping out the master with the education of the younger boys. And whilst he was probably sure that his career wouldn't end this way, his first ever job was as a farm labourer, just like his dad. But this was a man who was destined for higher things. He read widely and well. They've built a roundel here to Ramsay MacDonald in Prospect Terrace where he later wanted to build a house. But Lossy Mouth could never have contained his ambitions. And after a six month spell in Bristol, this young man from a small fishing village of Lossy, who like many Scots of his time, grew up humble in means, but rich in education, found himself in London. Now many of us would have felt crushed between the hammer of ambition and the anvil of Metropolis, but it forged him. Initially, the clerical equivalent of a coal miner heading to the pit face each morning with quill in hand, he toiled with little purpose. He later said, I went every morning to the city in the wake of the monarchs of finance, scrawled and scribbled and added and subtracted all day, and felt like I was one of those undistinguished ants who would be lucky if they continued by honest and effective service to earn a latch key and daily bread. But his evenings, his evenings were filled with socialist meetings, discussion circles, the ethical movement, the Scottish Home Rule Association, as well as studies at the Guildhall Library, the British Museum Reading Room, and a course of science at Birkbeck Institute. The Birkbeck Institute was part of London University that operated evening studies for workers. And as the steam hammer pounded, he worked himself to exhaustion. Now this was in the more fluid period in the political left, where party politics wasn't as well defined. For Macdonald, it was natural to be a member of the Socialist Union, attend Fabian Society gatherings and take up a job as a secretary to an Irish Liberal MP. Liberals were seen as radical. And the job that he took in professional politics transformed him. Although he would have jobs in both politics and journalism, his life's work would be the hewing of words the mining of inspiration and the struggle to bring peace and social unity to the surface. So in 1888, MacDonald worked as secretary to the radical liberal candidate for West Islington, Thomas Luff, down in London, and also helped Seymour Kay to win a parliamentary by-election here in Murray and Nairn. The world was seeing the metamorphosis to the colourful butterfly that emerged from the caterpillar peasant that had grown up and a button bend down there. Now this transformation wasn't overnight. They say that behind every great man, there's an astonished mother-in-law. And it's important not to minimize the impact of MacDonald's marriage to Margaret Gladstone. She was an active socialist campaigner herself. In fact, she even has her own monument in London. At the first meeting of the Women's Labour League, she was elected to the executive. 
She was independently wealthy, and that's why that meeting was held at the house that her income had recently bought for her and her husband. In fact, the house effectively became the headquarters of the Labour Party until it had enough funds to buy a premises. She had nobly thought about giving away what wealth she had, but the more humbly raised MacDonald told her, if you knew what it was to have ideal plans for work, a conviction of the strength to carry them out, at least to a valuable point, and no breakfast, you would see the real immorality of neglecting to use the opportunities that you have in life. Her moderate wealth allowed the couple a financial independence that he could not have obtained himself. Her income gave him the freedom to pursue a political career and equality for those that had none. There were attempts to stand as a Liberal candidate and then a crossover to the newly formed Independent Labour Party. There were failures at the ballot box and then an electoral alliance with the Liberals before the Labour Party's 26-seat breakthrough election in 1906, where Ramsay MacDonald won a seat in Leicester. After the next election in 1910, there was another Liberal government who sent overtures for MacDonald to become part of it, but he declined. Now, if you're paying attention, you can see 1914 approaching. A continent of crisscrossing military alliances, a Sarajevo shooting, and a nation mobilising for war. Now, in the patriotic clamour for war, it would take a principled man and a suicidal politician to stand in the House of Commons and impose it. And yet, that's what Ramsay MacDonald did. The right-wing press must have been delighted to have lack of patriotism to add to lack of paternity to justify their bile. Macdonald was vilified in the press, verbally abused in the streets and then voted out of office in his Leicester constituency. What was much worse, his opposition to the war led to him being withdrawn from membership of the Murray Golf Club. Tragic. Now, during the war, MacDonald had actually visited the front line and remained calm under fire while visiting troops. He'd shown more courage than most parliamentarians or journalists. But the John Bull newspaper's campaign against his treachery was enough to keep him out of the parliament at the 1921 election. Nevertheless, the dignity that he showed throughout meant that he was elected leader of the Labour Party the following year. In the 1923 election, the Conservatives failed to get a majority and Labour, gaining a greater share of the vote and more seats than the Liberals, were for the first time asked to form a government. And Ramsay MacDonald, the educated peasant from Lossiemouth, became the first ever Labour Prime Minister of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. After victory, he came back here to Lossie to plan his cabinet. In fact, he came back regularly throughout his life to this house that he built for his mother in 1909. He'd wanted to build it at Prospect Terrace, but local worthies didn't want a red building there. His mum could never imagined on the 12th of October 1866, as she brought her only child into the world fatherless, that on the 22nd of January 1924, he would become the first Prime Minister of a workers' party that as yet hadn't even been established. We can only imagine how proud she must have been. That was almost 100 years ago now. Now, a lot happened to Ramsay MacDonald and our country in the years that followed. Today's story stops here, although I would like to finish with a couple of questions. For example, I don't know who lives in this house today. They're probably much better off than the young Ramsay MacDonald ever was. But I do wonder if there was such a thing as the son of a peasant farmer from a single parent family in Lossiemouth today, what are the chances of them growing up to be Prime Minister? Did the 20th century really make us more equal? Given that Ramsay MacDonald, Keir Hardy and Nye Bevan were all born illegitimate, why is it that it's a Tory cabinet that's full of bastards? Also, why is it that the Labour Party's first ever Prime Minister was expelled from the Labour Party? That's a question for another video, but please share this one and click the link below to support the channel. I mean, Doc is going to be a lamb of my life. Cheer and